good morning, my friends. It's been a while, huh? <laughs> it's too long, I agree. Too long. I want to thank you all for your outpouring of love during the past month. It's been a month. <laughs> um, your love, your care, your prayer, your concerns, your patience, you all was in good hands, I know. But I, my family and I are very grateful for y'all's concern for us and love. We have a lot of things that I, I want to focus on in the new year. One of the things that we want to do is we want to start that gospel training seminar. Not just to learn the gospel, but we'll have a module that teaches that. We'll have a module that will teach you how to see it in the Bible yourselves, the steps to the gospel. We'll have a module that will teach you how to write your own Bible studies. So we're not going to be doing Doug Batchelor Amazing Facts, Doctrines. We're going to learn how to teach the gospel to friends, family, and neighbors. Then our last module will be how to preach it. And so we'll have a, once we get through that part of the course, we'll have an open Friday night mic. Everyone will learn how to develop a gospel-centered sermon on one of the steps of the gospel, and you get to preach to us, to your family and friends you can invite. And then the people that you've been contacting and studying with the coming months after that, that's who we will invite to the fall evangelism series that we'll do here, um, hopefully live. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing for that. So those are some of the things that we're going to be doing um, in the new year. Also, we have baptisms planned for February. I know there's several. If you were someone that asked me to, uh, about baptism, please, at some point in the next week or two, drop your name to me because I may have forgotten. I lost my list in there. I don't know where it went. But we have five or six people planning for baptism and rebaptism. So we're going to be looking for that sometime in the month of February, I'm fairly sure. So, but let's get back to business. Before all the nonsense hit in my life, let's get back to Daniel, right? Chapter 5. I read in the memory text Daniel chapter 12, verse 9, for a reason. Because Daniel 12, verse 9 gives relevance for why I'm sticking to this horse for a while. Daniel 12, verse 9 said, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the end of time. So those words were irrelevant for the next 600 years, and then another 2,000 years after that. For 2,600 years, those words meant nothing except to the people that they would be unsealed to. Revelation chapter 10 tells us that the end of time, and we recognize, and we had a whole lecture on that, that those words were meant for you and for myself. Telling us that the book of Daniel, the first six historical chapters, would be telling us everything that we need to know about Revelation 12, 13, and 14, the three angels' message, through symbols and through stories. It would be like shadowy kind of having to figure out what he's talking about, how it relates to the end-time gospel, and that's what we've been doing. The next six chapters, 7 through uh, 12, are very prophetic. They're very to the point. There's no shadow. There's no symbols. It's this is what's going to happen. So we've went, we're going through the book of Daniel for our purpose of learning what is the end time ideas, what is it that's important for us to know. So through the first four chapters, just by way of review a little bit, we could just boil down what we've learned that Babylon is a religion. It's not just a religion, it's a mindset. It's not just a church with a certain mandate, it is a mindset of the world. Political, economical, religious, spiritual, every way it comes together. And in the book of Daniel, those four chapters, we realize that Babylon simply does this. It's designed a spiritual religion to feed the carnal flesh. That's all that it is. It's a system of merit where man can figure up some kind of cheap and cheesy way to do some little thing to earn salvation. And then after that, anything goes. Which, by definition, means that God's law is out. A religion that teaches us to be Subjective, relative, wishy-washy, comfortable in what Jesus said the wide road would be. Babylon teaches us to be comfortable calling wrong right. Saying that there is no sin, there is nothing to turn from, there is nothing to repent of. Babylon teaches us to be comfortable where we are and at the same time giving you a sense that you're connected to some kind of religious spirituality that will give you some type of afterlife and eternal life. 
That has always been its history from the time of Cain all the way down to the very time that we live in. The biblical worldview is nearly gone. When Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone in Matthew 4, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that idea is archaic, it is out of date, and it's no longer relevant to the world. To actually take the Bible and say, I am going to attempt, with his help, to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is the antithesis to Babylon. It's the exact opposite. And so that's really what we've learned in the first four chapters we recognize that the book of Revelation tells us that Babylon will emerge at the end of time, bringing all of the world into one religious, economical, political, spiritual mindset. And we think, well, we're never going to be part of that. I am not going to be part of Babylon. But if you remember Daniel chapter 3, all of Israel bowed, didn't they? All the nobles, all the principals all of the people, including the king, bowed and did not realize what they were doing except for three men. The point should be duly noted and not missed that for 6,000 years, Satan threw Babylon in whatever way that was, whatever nation or person or entity through the course of time, has been honing the idea and tailor-making a religion that people will worship because they are already in love with it. And so God has given us the book of Daniel, its correlating book of Revelation, and many of the New Testament books to counteract that, to save man from going down a road that they think that they're not on because they have the right day of worship down. This is what we've got to be actually clear of. It's a consistent message throughout scriptures that the golden man, Babylon, falls. It loses its hold on people at some time, and there is a coming out into one way, one message, and that's it. There's no other ideas. So we're going to move now out of the life of Nebuchadnezzar. You know that Nebuchadnezzar lived to be a very old man. He lived to be 104 years old. At his death, he was converted to the religion of Daniel. He was a worshiper of God. His wife, Nicrates, was a worshiper of God. The entire, the entire Babylonian worldview was turned upside down and changed and transformed. And for a while, in the Babylonian history, they served the living God. They understood. Daniel taught them the points of the gospel, that, that at least that he knew back then. But in Daniel chapter 5, old Nebuchadnezzar is dead. He passes away. And his son, Nabodinus, and his grandson, Belshazzar, rule the kingdom. This is the context of chapter 5. And they throw a great big party. It's not just like a party just to have fun because the grandfather's passed away. It is a return back to the old Babylonian religion. They were galled by the, the works of their father and grandfather. They rejected, but they had to be careful because he was the most mightiest king of antiquity. So they went along complicently, but they did not really believe in their heart. And now that Nebuchadnezzar is gone and out of the way, there's a return back to the old ways. We see it every presidential cycle, right? When one goes out, they try to go back to this, and this one comes in, they go back to that. It's the same thing. They want to restore the Babylonian system of worship to their people and so there is a doubling down, and they start the whole thing. They kick it all off with this great big party. It's actually really a ceremony. And so in Daniel chapter 5, let's go there, because we are going to see the gospel all throughout this story. And it's really just a repeating of what's in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and you'll see again in 6, and in 7, and 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. God's repeating, 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 repeating with different flavors and pictures because the message is still the same. In Daniel chapter 5, let's read this, verse 1 through 4, Belshazzar, 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 the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and concubines, might drink from them. They brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines did drink from them. They drank wine and praised the God of gold and silver, bronze and iron and wood and stone four times. Don't miss this. Don't let it slip by you. He says they drank. 
It's like Daniel, it's, it's the way he's saying it is, they took the vessels from the house of God and they drank wine from them. They drank from them. They drank from them. I cannot believe they drank from them. That's how the story starts. The vessels from the temple of God, you know, there was underneath the table of showbread, there was two big flagons that wine was kept in. And then there was cups that the priests would drink from, but they were ceremonial drinkings. There was nothing that could be offered without blood. But when the symbol had to be the drinking, they used the pure grape juice as a symbol of the blood. Every offering had that grape juice symbol if they didn't have the real blood being used on the altar. The blood was a symbol of the pure grape juice, of the purity of the Messiah, of the pure sacrifice of Christ. It represented His pure nature, His pure divinity. It had to be completely without any kind of intoxication. It had to be with any kind of fermentation. It represented the expiation of sin by the coming Messiah through His blood. And the Babylonians took those symbols that were representing the blood of the coming Messiah and they filled them with fermented, rotten grape juice. The opposite of what it would represent it. Rotten, fermented, alcoholic grape juice represented sin because fermentation was a symbol of death. And they took something that was a symbol of the fallen, broken human nature of man and its consequence, which is sin and death, and they poured it in something that represented expiation of sin, and they drank it down. It came down their beards. They were drinking it. They were taking it into their souls. What do you think that Daniel is trying to say? <laughs> Rather than repenting of your sin that my grandfather taught you how to do through these golden vessels, you are drinking your sin. You are accepting it. You are embracing it and turning to a false Babylonian religion. But even more significant is in chapter 2, you see this, in chapter 5, you see the same thing that you saw in chapter 2. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. The same picture from Daniel chapter 2. They are choosing now a false religion just like their grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had done at the beginning of his life. It's a picture of rejecting God, rejecting his sanctuary, rejecting the plan of salvation. And turning to something of man's own devising and saying, this is what's going to save me. We're going to reject what God said is going to save me. That was confirmed by miracles in the book of Daniel. Something that they had saw and seen and knew was true. Turn from their senses. Turn from reason. Turn from God's word. And turn to something that was a fairy tale. Something that was fake. Something that was comfortable to mankind. Something that didn't demand repentance or, con or change or conviction. But turn to something that would allow you to do something to make you feel safe and then let you embrace your sinful life. 700 years later, John, in writing the Revelation, would shed light on what Daniel 5 was actually about. And it would shed light on what Revelation 17 is actually about by looking at Daniel 5. This is how Revelation and Daniel work together. In Revelation chapter 17, John is nearly quoting the entire story from Daniel 5. Daniel 7, Revelation 17 verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And verse, six, and verse 5 says, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints and the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. He was as shocked as Daniel when Daniel said they drank from the cups of God. This picture of this cup is a sign of being intoxicated willfully. It's a picture of sin and abominations that they were drinking down and accepting rather than the forgiveness that God offered through his plan of salvation. 
And as they're reveling in their choice of their newfound freedom from God and from repentance and blah, 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 and all that stuff and the sanctuary service, as they're reveling in that and embracing this new freedom, just do some sacrifices and all is good and all is okay and I can go about my life. As they're doing that, this is where the mysterious hand shows up. I love this part. In verse 5, right? And in the same hour... The fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that he wrote. Now, often this kind of jumps past us, this opposite of the lampstand. But we can pretty much assume that if all the golden vessels was there, the lampstand is also from the temple. And what was always in the sanctuary opposite from the lampstand? Table of showbread. And the table of showbread, remember, Jesus said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. The manna was, was just a symbol of me. I am the bread of life. You eat of me. This hand showed up where the table of showbread should have been. This hand was who? This is a picture of Christ. John chapter 1 says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. This is the hand, it's always a symbol of man. It is a, it is a hand that Daniel recognizes. It is a picture of Christ. It's like, okay, you, you don't want my salvation, you don't want my way, so you want your way, and then the way <laughs> shows up. It's a picture of judgment. It's a picture of God like, okay, so we're going to do this, right? So you're, that's your final answer. That's what you're going to stick with, Babylon, the golden image, right? You're going to reject this over here. So I'm going to play something out and work something out here that is going to be all the way down true to the end of time and cosmologically, universally, in the heavenly sanctuary. It is going to be a picture of the entire world at the end of time. That hand was the same hand that wrote on Mount Sinai on the, ten com on the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. That hand was the same hand that wrote in the sand with a woman caught in adultery. This is none other than what the Bible in the Old Testament at least calls the hand of God. And we know this is the pre-incarnate Christ. So it's a picture, it's a cautionary tale for every single human being that would live. That there is a judgment and God's going to decide if your religion... Or if his religion, and I'm not just talking about the difference between denominations. I mean, you can be in the same denomination, like we're all Seventh-day Adventists, or most of us are, and we can still pick and choose of what part of our religion we want to believe. And by picking and choosing different parts of our religion that we're going to accept and other parts that we're going to reject, you're still Babylonian. It's always the nature of what it does. And so what happens... When, when man, Daniel chapter 5 is going to tell us what happens when man rejects the clear statements of the word of God. And what happens when man decides to accept a different religion, a different way, a different thought. Verse 6. So he's happy, he's good, yep, he's going to choose this new way. In verse 6, then the king's countenance, when he sees the hand shows up, everything changes. Because he realizes, oh, that God that my grandfather worshipped... He just showed up in my court. <laughs> right? He just showed up. Then the king's countenance changed. And his thoughts troubled him. So that the joints of his hips were loosened. And his knees knocked against each other. I had a Hebrew professor saying that he basically lost control of his bladder. His knees grew weak. His face went from flush, red, ruddy, and happy to pale like a ghost. He trembled and he was sick and he was caving in at the scene because he knew he just stepped over the line. What just minutes ago was a happy, wonderful scene now became a very serious matter to him. It's where our world is headed. This is a scene of mankind. Keep that in your mind. Belshazzar is a type of people that choose a different way than what's been outlined in Scripture. In fact, Luke chapter 21, verse 26, really describes it well. 
of where our world is, I don't think we're headed there. I think we are, and we're just going to have greater revelations of it. Luke chapter 21, it's the signs of the times for Luke. Luke chapter 21, verse 26. And he's talking about all the signs and the times and the things, kind of like Matthew 24. Then verse 26, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The hearts of men will fail them for fear for the things they see coming on earth. I've never thought that that was true before until this past year. I mean, we started our year up off with Australia, California, the West Coast burning up in flames. We moved into COVID to where we were terrified of what it would do to us. Could you imagine now they're talking about a COVID-21, a COVID-22, much more deadlier, much more viral, much more contagious. The shutdowns, the growing destabilization of our world, the, the, the revelation of the corrupt financial markets that we all thought were not that bad a corrupt political system, a world in chaos, a country on the verge of total anarchy, fight, and chaos, never-ending accusations. But there is no fear like what's coming when mankind comes under the awareness that they've chosen the wrong way. When the plan of salvation ends, when probation closes, When the entire world enters into judgment, the Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for those that chose the way of Belshazzar. There is a fear in that that none of us have experienced. It was a fear like the antediluvian world with Noah learned of quickly when Noah preached judgment for 120 years. When Noah said, this is the way, walk ye in it, come this way, learn of God, help me be one of my builders and I'll explain to you what God wants. But they laughed and they mocked and they jeered and they disbelieved until the water was up to their neck. That is fear. The same fear that the Sodomites in the book of Genesis experienced. And it will be the same fear that anyone toasting the great Babylonian toast with the cup will experience at time's end. How does the king respond to this knee knock in fear? This is what Babylon always does. This is what the religious systems of the world always do. How does he respond to the fear? Verse 7. Then the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck. And he shall be the third ruler of his kingdom. This is a loud cry. This is the counterfeit loud cry. There has been a judgment proclaimed. There has been a gospel rejected. There has been a judgment that is right in front of them. And a loud cry goes out. At the end of time... When Babylon is at the height of its power, but right before it teeter-totters and falls, there is a false counterfeit revival movement that goes out to the world. It is a false third angel's message, a false loud cry. He cried out to his spiritual advisors, his gurus, his motivational speakers, his scientists, his political sages, his professors, his teachers, his elites of society, his activists, his journalists, his talk show hosts of the times. He cried out to all the people that he trusts, and that is what mankind will do today. It's what they're doing right now. We're looking to the world, we're looking to people, we're looking to any other kind of spiritual experience except the one that is right in front of us. Listen to this statement. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work, and before the time of such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifested what is thought to be a great religious interest. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Babylon has already got everyone else. It's the Christian world and particularly the Protestant Christian world. 
that he seeks with a counterfeit revival movement to sweep you into their ranks. So I always say this, and I want to say it with some caution, but I still mean what I mean. Be careful what you're listening to. I mean, I know that, there, that there's good sermons, and they've got good ideas, and they've got great music out there, and, and some of it is always really biblical, but look out and be careful that your mouth is not wide open and you gulp something down into your mind that turns you away from the truth. There is a danger in these Protestant preachers that are preaching half of a gospel, part of a gospel, most of the time, and then slip it in something that you're like, huh? But you really like the guy now. So you, you swirl that around and then you spew it out at Sabbath school or you talk about it to your friends. And before you know it, you are believing. You know that text that says, remember Lot's wife? I think what would be relevant today would be to say, remember Eve. If you look at Eve, there's one thing that she should have never done, and that was stop to hear a serpent speak. She should have never stopped to enter into dialogue, and yet God's people go to Babylon all the time and enter into dialogue with their books, their writings, their preachers. And for most of the time, it can be benign for you, and maybe you can even benefit from some of it, but some of it is deadly. And that's how she works, to bring about a false counterfeit movement that the whole world thinks we're entering into some great enlightenment age. And believe me, I fell prey to it. I don't know if y'all know who Russell Brand is. He's a guy I don't know much about him. I've seen him before. He's kind of a goofball, but he's like a philosopher and sage of the time. I guess he's in his 40s. And he popped up on my YouTube feed, and so I listened to him. And within two minutes, I was captivated. Of course, he's got the English accent, so we're always <laughs> captivated by the Queen's English. But I started listening to him, and he was talking about you know, the American politics, and, and he was talking about conservatives versus this, and he was talking about the ridiculous nature of this and that, and I was going, this guy's got some great points. He's a very progressive guy, and, and I'm not so much, but... He was making sense, and I was getting caught up, and I was listening 5, 10, 15 minutes. And then he started talking about that mankind is on the eve of the greatest spiritual revival that the world has ever known. That we, for the first time in human history, collective, in a collective consciousness, are beginning to gravitate to this one idea, which is after listening to the whole thing, is nothing but Neoplatonism, which is just Greek philosophy. The whole concept that we are all tied and coming to this energy in the cosmos, this mind, this wisdom of it's a non-personal being, but we're all being, we're coming into the one. And then he said this, he said, we're all coming into the same mind of God. But to him, God was a collective consciousness that the universe is speaking and the world is, is tying into this energy. And I went, oh, man. And then he said this. However, what's holding us back is a few old archaic belief systems. I thought, ooh, there it is, man. A few old archaic systems. All that Babylon has to do is cut the tie from a few old archaic systems. Please be careful what you listen to. Anything that makes de facto Revelation 14, anything that makes de facto the everlasting gospel revealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the sanctuary, revealed through the gospel of Paul, anything that makes the gospel irrelevant, especially the everlasting gospel of the three angels' message, run from it with your life. Because these false revivals, Daniel tells us, has an end. Belshazzar is trying to create a false revival, a false loud cry. He's trying to look for answers out there in the world. And they all come together in verse 8 through 9. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing <laughs> or make known to the king its interpretation. And the king Belshazzar was greatly troubled and his countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. Like, so he was all happy again. The great revival created a sense of euphoria, a sense of happiness, but no one had the answer to the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall is everything. No one has the answer to how to survive or how to, to get through that judgment hour of God. Nobody but one. 
And all the king's men and all the king's horses, right, all of that they had in Babylon did not have the answer, and the king's countenance fell again. Now, my favorite part of the story is coming up. Verse 10 through 12 is actually one of my favorite parts. Then the queen, because of the words of the king and the lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and we will give the, he will give the interpretation. This is interesting. This is not the queen of Belshazzar. Theologians agree that this is Nicrotus. This is the old queen mother. She's not there at the banquet because she's a worshiper of the most high God. She still believes and she hears of this great banquet of, of going back to the old false Babylonian system and she wants nothing to do with it until she hears about the hand. And when she hears about the hand and she hears about this false revival going out, she busts in the door like a blast from the past. She steps in there and she says, King, live forever. Don't be troubled because I have an answer. I have an answer for you. Your father. Try to name this man who is called Daniel Belteshazzar, but his name is Daniel. God is my judge. She's coming with the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. She knew the gospel. She understood it, and this is what the first angel does. When Babylon reaches its apex, when the counterfeit movement goes out, the first, second, and third angel's message flies into the world and says, no, we have a judge in heaven. There is a judgment going on, and there is a way to survive this judgment, so don't be afraid. Don't fear the hand on the wall. Embrace that hand, because that hand is your Savior who's going to show up in 600 years from now. And this is our message to the world, isn't it? To tell the world when they're having this knee-knocking, fearful experience, when the Spirit of God is poured out on all mankind, when Babylon is falling, when men know it no longer has the answers, right? Isn't that what Revelation tells us? That there comes a time, right? Because in verse 17, what does Daniel say? Da Daniel does show up at the court. And, and Belshazzar says, look, tell me... Tell me the interpretation and I will, make you, I will make you third in the kingdom and do this and do that for you. And Daniel says, keep your gifts. We don't want them. Let them be for another. And that's what happens in Revelation 18. It gives you that list. Remember we read that list of all the, the monkeys and the gold and the silver and the workers and the ships. and the, It's just this litany of stuff. And we reckon that it was a spiritual language telling us that all that Babylon affords, all that Babylon has promised, it's entertainers, it's sports, it's hobbies, it's habits, it's months, it's houses, it's attainments, all that you can get, all that you feel from it. All that is in the world is Babylon. There comes a time when men say, I don't want it, keep it for yourself. In Revelation 18, it says they buy their goods no more. And that is the drying up of Babylon. That is the end of Babylon. That is the coming to the end of Babylon because the Spirit of God is poured out on mankind, all of mankind. They know that Babylon does not have the answers and they start to look for the answers. And God says, I need my queens to show up and say, there is a God in heaven. There is a right way. This is the way. I know it is completely like improper to say that today. It is completely the most toxic thing that you can say that there is only one way. Especially when the Pope just came out and said, oh, no, 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 no. There's a lot of ways. Taoism, Confucianism, Muslim, Judaism, you name it. Anyway, always go to the same God. Let's get along and have unity. Queen Nicrotus would say, nope. <laughs> There's only one way. You already see the world turning from Babylon, don't you? You already see the world saying, you know, I ain't watching sports no more. I'm sick of these guys. These are a bunch of overpaid young men and women. Their frontal lobes are not even fully developed yet. What are we doing? 
The world's turning away from movies, turning away from Hollywood. We're sick of politicians. Fox News, their ratings have plummeted. People just don't want nothing to do with it no more. There's no more answers. It's a bunch of lies and hypocrisy and craziness and who said this and she said that. We don't want it no more. The past month of my life has been the most horrific month of my life. Many nights I laid there and thought, what in the world? Like Scott's testimony. Thanks, brother. What in the world was I thinking? How did I get so caught up and tied up in this world? I'm so aggravated and agitated and lashing out and angry and mad and upset and wars and little committees. and I, No, that's Babylon. I want what the queen had to offer. There is a man who God has given wisdom. There is a gospel that God has given wisdom to. There is a gospel, and it's very simple to understand. I realize that that is all that matters. Babylon does not have the answer for the sin-sick, burdened soul that is looking for relief. Your new age experience is not going to give it to you. Your mystical experience is not going to give it to you. I mean, there's this resurgence of mysticism in the United States, of Wiccanism and occultism. It's just going through the roof with young people. They think there's answers in it. They think there's power in it. Daniel says, nope. <laughs> but before Daniel pronounces judgment against this king, he reads the indictment. Here you go. Man, I wish we could spend so much more time on the indictment. But before he says what the handwriting on the wall actually means, he indicts the king. Verses 18 through 22, right? Now think about this in a modern setting for the end of time. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all people's nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. Whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men his heart was made like that of a beast. His dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with the grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. Although you knew, you knew. Right? Doesn't tell us in the New Testament that the Pharisees and the scribes, they knew he was the Messiah. They said, no man can do these things and not be from God. And many people today, they know their way is wrong. They know what they're doing is not right. They know that that attitude that they've had or copped on somebody, the aggression, the anger, the resentment, the jealousy, the pride, the gossiping, the position that they've taken, the things that they feel, their attitude towards someone, they know. Because if the life of Christ is the ultimate embodiment of the law, and we are believing keeping the law here, not to be saved, but as evidence, proof, and fruit that our faith is real. But if we believe that the law is more than the letter, more than the spirit, more than the very heart of the law, but if we believe that Christ is the very embodiment of the law of God, then his life is constantly condemning me for my attitudes. And I know that the things that I do, the things that I say, the things that I feel, I know that they are wrong, and yet I hold to them, even though I know what the Word says. If a man comes up to you, Damon Sneed, and slaps you in the face, do what? Yeah. If someone says, come with me a mile, go with him too. If someone curses you, you pray for them. If they hate on you, you lift them up. You love one another. Bear one another's burdens. Pray for people. Care, love. Return evil with goodness and kindness. It's all right there in the life of Christ. And yet I know that and still persist in my own way sometimes.
Belshazzar knew, and yet he still lifted himself up. He did not do the one thing that God has asked us to do. Verse 22, did you catch it? The one thing that God has asked, but you, his son Belshazzar, have not what? Humbled your heart. It's just simply another way of saying repenting of your sin, receiving what God has said about you, humbling yourself like your father Nebuchadnezzar did when he confessed, when he acknowledged and found true salvation. You have not humbled your heart, and that's what we have to do. God is always trying to humble the heart of Damon Sneed. Again, the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, he humbled himself into the dust and God lifted him up. If we take what God is revealing about us, he will forgive us, he will protect us, he will cover me, he will lift me up. But in Babylon... Rather than humbling ourselves, Daniel says in verse 23, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You didn't humble yourself, you lifted yourself up. You know what that means, don't you? To lift ourselves up means that we set our own mind on what we do. We justify it, we excuse it. We find reasons to hold on to that one thing, to do that one thing continually over and over. We find ways to lift ourselves up. Verse 23 continues, You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. This is the first angel's message again. Nicker just came in with it, and now... Daniel comes in with it. What's the first angels? Fear God and give glory to Him. He says, you have not brought glory to God. You have brought glory to yourself. You've lifted yourself up against Him. To give God glory means the glory of man gets laid in the dust. That's the humbling of ourselves. That is the admission of our guilt, of our sin. That is the repentance. That is the crying out for His righteousness. That is the coming into compliance with God, obedience to His law and way, being sanctified by His Spirit. That is what it means when we give Him glory. We receive that. We know what we are. We know what He is. To hold on to sin, to excuse it, to justify it, is to lift yourself up against God. It's a refusal to hear what he's trying to say. We, God allows us to go through rough things. And sometimes those things we don't deserve. Sometimes it's not because of something we did. Sometimes it is. But he allows hard times to come. And during those hard times, God cracks us open and we cry out and we say, God, forgive me, a sinner. I laid in a bed for three weeks. I thought I was going to die. And one night I just got up and I, I crept into the bedroom, into the chair in the living room, and I just said, God, forgive me. And what came to my mind? The moment I conceded to my need of forgiveness, what came to my mind was a list of events going all the way back to last March. Things that I had done, attitudes that I had. Oh, God allows these things to come upon us, but they are meant for our good. Because, like Daniel said, right, He is the God that holds your breath in His hand and owns all your ways. Don't be afraid of the hand. Don't be afraid to be humble. Don't be afraid to, to just open yourself up and let God in. Don't be afraid of that because He holds your life in His hand. In all your ways, He owns. He already knows everything about you. But he's a God that cares, a God that loves. I got a picture of me and Ella when she was just like three months old, and I'm holding her in my hand. And you can look on my face and know that I'm looking at that child with nothing but pure love in my soul. This is what Daniel is telling Belshazzar. You knew all this. You rebelled against him. You lifted up yourself against him. Why? He loves you. He holds you in your hand. Humble yourself, Belshazzar. And that is the message to the world at the end of time. 
But in Babylon, we self-justify, we blame, we excuse, we deny, we look away, we say, who, me? No. Not me. You see, for, for the man that does not humble himself, for the man that turns away from the gospel, the hand on the wall is a hand of doom. But for Daniel, man, it was a, when that hand showed up and Daniel knew I mean, I cannot believe that they didn't know that the Persian army was, was all around them. And death comes to the rulers, the aristocracy, usually. When that hand shows up, Nebuchadnezzar's knees are knocking. But Daniel, he's like, oh, that's my God. He's, he's here again. He's like in his 80s. He's like 86 years old at this time. He's an old man. He hasn't seen God for quite a while. And the last time I think he's seen him is in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. It's been a, quite a, a long time, and when that hand shows up for Daniel, it is a hand of wonder, a hand of help, a hand of love, a hand of guidance, of friendship, of security, of covering. For Daniel, it was like the old song Jimmy Swaggart sings, put your hand in the hand of the man that walked the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man that calmed the sea. Put your hand in the man, hand of the man from Galilee. That's what Daniel saw. But now he's going to interpret the writing, and it, you know the rest of this story, right? It don't go well. And this is the inscription that was written. He says in verse 26, this is the interpretation of the word many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The word for Paris is actually a, a, a breaking up, to be broken up. He said, King, this ain't good news. You had the right way before you. You grew up with it. You knew it. You rejected it. You turned to this. You lifted yourself up with God. You refused to humble yourself. You rejected the gospel. You turned to your own religion that was custom made and tailored for your own vices and the way that makes you feel good. And now you have been weighed. You have been weighed. You have been counted. And you will be divided. Because you are found wanting. Because he didn't have that covering. He didn't have that righteous hand of God to cover him in that judgment. He stood in that judgment on his own merit. He stood in that judgment in his own idea of what he thought religion was. And God said, okay, I'm going to weigh you, count you, and now I'm going to divide you. That's what happens to the world. In verse 30, it tells us that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. The spiritual implications at the end of time for the entire world is sobering. But there's good news in the story. Verse 29, it always ends this way. Verse 29, then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel. There's always this clothing aspect. It's, a, it's like a ceremony that God does. At the end of the judgment, those that trusted in God to save them, those that found the gospel to be true and held to it and did not hold to their sin but repented and humbled themselves before God, they get clothed, not condemned. Revelation chapter 7, it's the angels talking to other angels. And, and John is like, well, what is all this going on? And he asks a question, who are these people? In Revelation chapter 7, it says this, verse, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Verse 13, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed? Who are these that are clothed in white robes? And, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Right? Daniel is a picture of being robed in the righteousness of Christ because we have washed our sins. We have held nothing back. We have given him permission to come into my soul and look at me, God, with everything and every eye that you got and see me as I am and lead me, Lord, in the way of everlasting. That's why David said, break the bones, Lord, that you may heal them. Show me, cleanse me. That is always the gospel story, and it's hard for human beings to humble themselves to the point that they have to make confession to God, but even harder to one another. In this past year, 
Has God revealed something to you in your life? Has He revealed to you something that you need to humble yourself before God and even before your fellow brother or sister? Has He got something in your life that He wants you to stop excusing and lifting yourself up, but just humble yourself and say, God, you know all things, you see all things. I confess, I relinquish, I empty myself. I don't care what people think about me. This is what I am. God, forgive me, bless me, help me, save me, Lord. There's something in your life, I, I, I would encourage you, as Scott did, great testimony, to make it right with God immediately and stop lifting ourselves up. So in my conclusion for chapter 5, here is what I learned. The way of Babylon, this past month I was thinking of, it's really a hard way. I mean, it's easy in one way. It indulges the flesh. It makes you feel good. You, you have a pressure relief. Your self-talk sounds good. Your temper is satisfied. But your conscience is never quieted in Babylon. The soul is never at peace. The heart is always wounded. But to the humble ones that turn themselves to God to, to confess, to repent, to make themselves right with God, there is fullness of heart. There is peace at night. There is a clean conscience. And that's what I want. I want that peace in my heart. I don't want to be in conflict with any man, any woman, any person. It's not going to be easy. Galatians 5.17 says the flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. Your flesh ain't going to let you just go idly by and start confessing everywhere and repenting everywhere. It's not going to let you do that. They're going to bring something up that says, uh-uh, they deserve it. <laughs> no, 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 you were right. Ah, the flesh is a devil, literally. Don't lift yourself up. Humble yourself before God. Two Wednesdays ago, sitting in the hospital, it became crystal clear to me what Daniel 5 is all about. What this whole thing is really all about. Two Wednesdays ago, I got a phone call from my little brother saying the doctors has called us and told us that daddy's body is shutting down. He's not responding to the intubation. His kidneys are failed. His heart's going out. It's just torturing him. They want us to come up and sign the papers, and if we would like to, we could be with him. We wasn't ready for what we saw. They tried to warn us when we got there. The body had already started having issues. They told us hospice would be in there in a couple of hours. They told us what would happen, and so we waited, and we waited, and we waited in there with Daddy. And then the hospice workers came in. The room was filled with nurses. They walked in the room, and it was like, you know, you're in a hospital. There's this distance. They're supposed to be saving life, but it's just this strange. They put this blue thing over him, and they was talking to him like he could hear and I was thinking, I was watching them pull the tube out, and, I, and, and my mind was, was like, one side of my emotions was saying, oh, it's just a procedure, they're, they're going to save, and the other side was saying, no, this, he's dying, this is it. They pulled the tube out, and they left, and they gave us some privacy, and the most awful, gut-wrenching experience I ever had with those five minutes, the worst five minutes I have ever seen in my life. The most gut-wrenching pain and sorrow. I have never been afraid, really, of anything in my life. But I was filled full of terror and fear. I grabbed my daddy's hand. I felt his pulse, and I was watching the machines, you know, the life support machines. I just kept watching the numbers go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And he was taking, struggling for air. And then I couldn't feel his pulse. And I was watching his stomach, and he breathed his last. And you know what I was thinking during all of this? It just kept flashing into my mind. I was quaking. I was shaking. Travis, he lost his strength in his knees. He fell to the floor. I kept thinking, this is really what Daniel 5 is about. I was working on this sermon then. 
This is what it's all about. This is all that matters. That my daddy's name, the handwriting on the wall was happening. I was watching the final moments of his life. I was watching his judgment. I was watching his name about to enter into the books of heaven. The investigative judgment for him. I kept thinking his time is running out. I don't want it to run out. I kept saying, Dad, breathe again. Breathe again. But he stopped and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It's over. It is over for him. And that is the quintessential truth of all things. That we have a limited amount of time. We all are going to have a handwriting on the wall. We all are going to face a judgment. Every single one of us at some point in time, it's over with. And for dad, just two weeks before, he was planning on building his front porch. I went out to my mother's house and there's all the wood. There's this tractor with his gloves still ready to go. His whole life just came to a stop without him realizing it. And that is the truth of the time that we're living in. We are on borrowed time. And we don't have time to be fooling with Babylon. We don't have time to be fooling with pretty nice sounding things. We have time for nothing but one thing. And we have been called as a people to do one thing. And it is to prepare the world for that judgment. That is the Seventh-day Adventist message to the world. We must teach them to be clothed. And not allow them to waltz into a knee-knocking experience unprepared. We must tell the world, tell our kids, tell our family, tell our church that that hand writing on the wall does not have to be the end. You don't have to be afraid of it because that same hand that condemns is the same hand that lifts up to the man that will humble himself before his God. Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful. We are so grateful that that same hand that would cause one to tremble in another sense causes one to have hope. God, help us in our own lives to humble ourselves and search our hearts and souls and minds before you. Lead us to repentance, Lord. Convict us like David, Lord. Search and try us and see if there be any wicked way in my life, in my attitude, in my feelings and affections and thoughts. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Lead me to repentance, Lord, where I can confess my sin. Get them off of me into that sanctuary, on that curtain, which is Christ. That I may have repentance and forgiveness of sin and have a clean conscience when that time comes. That I may be found, Lord, being clothed in his righteousness. Lord, thank you so very much. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.